I bet you never thought I was coming back. <laughs> um, so I'm at the airport. I am about to go out and find a bus and I'm going to Salt Lake and I'm coming back to Denver and it's all I'm doing. It's a turn. I was supposed to have a turn tomorrow, but I got rid of that one because there's just too much going on at home. I have a turn on Wednesday and I have a turn on Friday and I'm back. Now I'm not gonna lie to you, I have all those in giveaway. I have all those trying to give them back to the company. So we'll see what this vlog turns into, but I'm back. It is October 9th and hi guys. I'm glad to be back, but I have enjoyed my time home and I'm gonna take advantage of all the rest of the time I can get off before the holiday season. So let's head into the airport. All right, so I walk into the airport and then we're delayed for 50 minutes. I don't know why, I don't know why. We were originally supposed to be on an 800, then they switched us to a 700 that was coming from Cancun and I was like, yay, it'll be cleaned. And then they switched us to a plane coming from Burbank late and then our pilots are coming from San Jose. So I don't honestly know why we're late, but we left late. We're only leaving with 27 people, so let's go, let's go home. Good morning, I got home at like 2 a.m. So our pilots, they were awesome. We left 48 minutes late. When we came back to Denver, we were only 14 minutes late. So they made up a ton of time, which I really appreciate it. But I'm tired. My husband wasn't feeling well this morning and so I was hoping that he would get up and take Hannah to school this morning, but he is not feeling good. I'm in the drive-thru at Starbucks. I gotta go get my hair done. <laughs> So that's what I'm doing today. And then I have a turn tomorrow, unless it gets picked up. So we'll see, we'll see. This is kind of like one of those at you're at home with me vlogs, which honestly I tried to make. <laughs> I kept forgetting to vlog. So I can also just kind of give you an update of what's going on with life and other stuff, but I'm gonna get some coffee first. Got my hair done. So all my grays are gone. And you know, that kind of reminded me that I don't think I've ever shared my cancer story with you guys. So I think I'm gonna share that with you. If anyone out there you know who has cancer, who's had cancer, I was diagnosed October 5th of 2017 with breast cancer. And I thought I would share that story with you since it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Ironically, I was actually diagnosed with breast cancer in October. So I'm gonna share my story with you. Got a little bit of time before I have to go pick up my daughter from school. So let's talk about my diagnosis. End of September of 2017, we noticed that I had a lump in my left breast. Now I was 40 and I hadn't gotten my baseline mammogram at 40 because when I was 40, I was pregnant with my daughter. Maybe I was 41. I was 41. <laughs> Do you guys forget what your age is? I forget all the time. So March of 2016, I was pregnant with my daughter. That's when I turned 40. You can't get a mammogram when you're pregnant and then you have to wait six months after you are done breastfeeding. First baby, my life was busy. And so Hannah was, I think 18 months, about 18 months when we discovered the lump. So I called and I called the breast center, the imaging center and was like, hey, you know, I found this lump and they made an appointment for me. I told them it was four and I went in and I put on the paper gown and then the technician was like, so have you noticed any changes in your breasts, you know, whatever. And I told her, I was like, yeah, well, I'm here because I found a lump. And then she's like, oh, well, we can't see you till you're seen by your doctor. And then they send you in for a diagnostic mammogram and so I'm like what so I had to leave and then I went out and made an appointment with my OB for her luckily she was able to see me within that week I think I think that was like a Tuesday and then I went to see her on Friday and she felt the lump they can't tell you anything from the way the lump feels so she did a, a script for a diagnostic mammogram and so I went in to have that done the following week and she does the mammogram on both sides, not just the left side was my issue. And she asked me, she's like, so have you been sick lately? And I was like, no. And I said, well, why? And she said, you have a swollen or inflamed lymph node on the left-hand side. And I was like, no, 
Uh uh. Then I get a call from the technician, the, the head over radiology. She goes, so you have a lot going on and nothing you, <laughs> that is not what you wanna hear when you go in for a mammogram for a lump that you've discovered. So it turns out I had the main lump and then I had, I guess, a small nodule or lump behind that. I had inflammation in my left lymph nodes. I had issues going on in my right breast. So next step is biopsies. So if any of you guys have gotten biopsies, you know they're nerve wracking, but I am a very optimistic person. I'm also a very curious person. So I had two needle aspirations. So that's when they use just an ultrasound machine to guide a needle in and take pieces out. I had three, I had a couple of those, and then I had a mammography or mammogram guided needle biopsy, which is where they put you in this machine. And let me tell you, if the if men had to stick their privates through um, the hole in this machine and dangle it and have it be put into a clamp and have it numbed and then have a needle run into it, they would come up with another way to do this. But, so yeah, you have to lay down, you have to climb upstairs, because this machine is probably four feet off the ground, lay down on your stomach, dangle your breast through this hole, they clamp it, they numb you, and then they actually poke the wrong spot. <laughs> then I jerked and, you know, I'm clamped in. So I had those four. And then, I think it was the next day, the next day they called me, and she read me this big long spiel about malignant, blah, blah, blah. This is my diagnosis up on the screen. If you want to read it and in essence, they call you and they tell you you have cancer and you're like, oh my gosh, I just got off a phone call and I have cancer. Wow. And so then they get you set up with a nurse navigator and that's where the journey began. Today is Friday. I got rid of my turn on Wednesday, but I could not get rid of this one. So I thought I got to do something with my hair put a little makeup on. It's a turn, so I'm going from Denver to Dallas, Dallas to Denver, I believe in about an hour. It's uh, about 11.30, and then I land back in Denver at 7.25 p.m. I'm taking two of my daughters and, and two friends to see the Taylor Swift movie. <laughs> I don't wanna go. And then my stepdaughters are headed to see their mom for fall break. I'm just ready for tonight to be over. I don't wanna go to this thing. So let's get ready. I left you on my cancer story. They called called me, told me, and said, okay, well, next step is getting an appointment with our nurse navigator. So this was a Friday. I called my husband and tried to get a hold of my husband, and then I called and made an appointment with the nurse navigator. And we were able to get into this nurse navigator that day. So my husband comes home. Here's my thing is I'm not a big crier. I didn't cry during this process. I didn't cry a lot. My husband is a very tender-hearted man and he shed more tears than I did. So we went to see the nurse navigator to find out next steps. The first thing she said is that this is not a death sentence. Cancer treatments have come a long way in the past decade, specifically for those who unfortunately get diagnosed with stage four cancer, which stage four is when the original origin, which was for me, breast cancer, has traveled to another location. That is what everyone has always called in the past terminal cancer. It's called stage four cancer now. There are a lot of people who are able to live with stage four cancer. It's not always terminal anymore because I hadn't been staged at this point. If my cancer had spread from the breast, that there was a lot of treatments for cancer in that stage. With her, we found out the next steps were to see, to see the breast doctor and after I saw her, and got some more imaging done, then I would go see an oncologist. And so then the next step was I made an appointment, I'm pretty sure it was pretty quick, with the breast doctor and she ordered a PET scan, or she ordered more imaging. It's hard, it was seven, six years ago, so some of the steps I don't remember. So I talked with her, I don't know if it was based on that imaging, and then I got genetic testing done because of my family history, like I think I told you before, my grandmother had died of metastatic breast, breast cancer, which is breast cancer that spreads from the breasts. And then my aunt had passed away, so we had genetic testing done. In the end, I don't want to get caught up in the exact timing, based on the PET scan, which praise God the PET scan came back clear, the only areas that lit up were my breasts and my thyroid, 
because of my hypothyroidism, the cancer had not spread outside the breast. So the breast doctor, the surgeon, she recommended based on my family history, based on the fact that I had disease on both breasts, to have a double mastectomy, to not risk the right hand breast was what's called DCIS, which is stage zero cancer. It's kind of like when you catch a mole that's precancerous. It might not turn into cancer, but it could turn into cancer. The decision to do the double, not really that hard. My grandmother had only done a lumpectomy back in the day. It's hard not to second guess when a disease spreads, but my mom really wishes that my grandmother had done a mastectomy because she really feels that by just doing the lumpectomy, she might not have reoccurred because she ended up having breast cancer twice and then lung cancer if she had gone with the mastectomy right away. So I went to see the oncologist and so that's when they start to talk about what type of breast cancer you have. If you're not familiar with breast cancer, there's lots of different types. And so the only thing I knew because I had a friend from elementary school that I had kept in contact with that the only kind I didn't want was what's called triple negative breast cancer. It's one of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer. I think the only form that's higher than that is something called inflammatory breast cancer, IBC. And just so you know, that's where it, it presents as a rash on your breast, not as a lump. And so it's misdiagnosed a lot because people go to their dermatologist, it doesn't get diagnosed right away as breast cancer, and then a lot of times it can spread. So triple negative, is like one kind of tier below that. Based on my the size of my lumps and the amount of disease I already had, she ended up staging me as 3B. I don't know, since it hadn't left my breast, I wasn't gonna be a stage four, I don't know if there's a 3C or not. One of the highest stagings before you are considered stage four. And triple negative is a fast growing aggressive breast cancer. So that's why the lump kind of developed what seemed to us like overnight. So next steps after I got staging was to talk treatment. For me, the treatment was to start with chemotherapy. So I was gonna do 16 chemo treatments, 12 and then four. So I started with Taxol and Carboplatin. Carboplatin and Taxol together and so you do chemo, and then you take a week off, and you do chemo, and then you take a week off. And I was gonna do 12 rounds of that concoction. And then I was gonna do four weeks of the Red Devil, which I'm blanking on what the name is, which is a really harsh type of chemo. And we talked with her a little bit about egg retrieval. I was 41 and we had been discussing, we were trying to have another baby. I have Hannah and we were at the time actively trying to have another baby. I think in the whole thing, that's what got me the most, is that she said, I don't advise taking the time to do an egg retrieval surgery. That was the hard, one of the hardest things for me, is that we couldn't retrieve my eggs, and chemo basically kills your eggs, especially at my age. <laughs> there, there have been cases where people have done chemo and then been able to naturally have a baby after, but also an interesting fact about triple negative is you can be pregnant and you don't have to terminate the pregnancy with triple negative because it does not feed on female hormones like hormone positive breast cancer does. So there's so many different types of breast cancer. So you get like a crash course in all of this stuff and things I didn't know. I didn't know that there were these types of cancers. Again, the only reason I knew I didn't want triple negative is because one of my friends from elementary school had it. I started chemo in October of 2017 and I did a cooling cap. I don't know if you are familiar with that, but that's like a gel. They put this thing on your head that runs like super cooled liquid. I think it's like 32 or 30 degrees and it goes on your head and then they put a neoprene cap on and you're hooked up to all these tubes and you're hooked up to this machine that pumps this super cooled liquid through to help you keep your hair because chemotherapy targets fast growing cells because that's what cancer is. It's a fast growing cell. It can't tell the difference between cancer and you know hair follicles and your hair follicles are a fast growing cell. So that's the reason you go bald when you have cancer. So I did the cooling cap and I kept the majority of my hair through the first type of chemo. Okay, I'm downstairs. I'm eating a snack. I'm making myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. 
I'm packing myself a little lunch, a dinner, a dinner, whatever you call it. Okay, so we go and I start chemo in October of 2017. I'm doing the cooling cap. I actually get a haircut and I do really good on chemo. They check your levels every single time before you do chemo and I never had to skip one. I didn't have huge adverse reactions to the chemo. I really attribute that to prayer. I did really good on the chemo. So we do the 12 of the carboplatin and the tax, taxol I think is what it was. And then we do the red devil. So what's interesting about the red devil is that in the other chemo, you know, they hang the bag that they have the mixologist in the back mixes your treatment. They hang it up with the saline and then the, like they time how long you have to sit in the chair for the chemo portion. For the red devil, it's a big syringe. The liquid inside is red. The nurse has to suit up. They have to put a visor on to protect their eyes from splash. I mean, they push it over a certain amount of time and actually it's very fast compared to the other ones. And then you have to sit. So with the cooling cap, you had to sit longer than the chemo time. And each type of chemotherapy had how long you had to sit in the chair. <laughs> what was funny is I always have to pee. And so whenever I had to pee, I, they had to come unattach me from the cooling cap machine. Cause for regular chemo, it was on a, a stick with wheels. So I could have wheeled that into the bathroom, but with chemo, with the cooling cap, I'm attached to this giant machine that I can't take me with me to the bathroom. So my nurse, Alex, who I love, she'd always get laugh at me because I would eat during chemo. Cause if you have chemo, sometimes you didn't get nauseous till after. So the best time to eat is while you're doing chemo. And I would sit in this room. I will say getting chemotherapy done in the suburbs is the best because I think my oncologist had maybe 12 chairs and I've been to University of Colorado. Their infusion area is huge. I have a, a scar right here. That's where my port was. So that's how they, I would get my chemo is they would access the port. I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> I have it in a drawer. <laughs> it's a little thing that goes underneath your skin that they push the needles into. So it really doesn't hurt. They put numbing cream on it for the puncture but that goes in and then it's directly into your heart and then your heart pumps it throughout your body. So I did the chemo for 16 weeks and then I got to ring the bell for the end of chemo and that's when I had surgery. Surgery was more difficult than the chemotherapy for me. So I was getting a double mastectomy and I had decided to get a reconstruction called deep flap it's D-E-I-P, flap, and that's instead of implants. So they took a portion of my belly, so they went down to my C-section scar and then a little bit above my belly button, and they cut a big, thick piece of fat, and they actually tuck that underneath, and that's what they create your breasts out of, is out of belly fat. And then, so I have a new belly button. <laughs> it's got little stitch marks in it. So you do the mastectomy, they remove your breasts, and then you have every plastic surgeon and breast surgeon where they work is a little bit different, but so they do the removal of the breast and then they put expanders under the skin that they fill with saline solution or air to expand your chest and hold that breast shape. And then you get radiation. And then after radiation, after your skin heals from radiation, you go back for reconstruction. So when I had my mastectomy, it should have been all one procedure. They remove the breast tissue, they put the expanders in, and then usually they'll fill the expanders on the table or sometimes you have to go in for several fills. And when I came out from anesthesia, I was flat. And we knew that that was a worst case scenario. So I love my plastic surgeon and he saved me skin. He makes sure that there was blood flow in the tissue so that I wouldn't lose skin. And when they went to do a blood flow test in the skin that was left over, I did not have good blood flow on my right hand side. So they chose to leave me flat and I was actually flat for three weeks. And by flat, you're actually concave. It's the weirdest TMI. I've never had a big chest. I was always made fun of in high school for being flat chested. It was so weird, it was weird. So any of you guys out there who have chosen to go flat or are thinking about it, 
it's a very interesting thing. That messes with your head a little bit. For me, it did. So I was flat for three weeks until the blood vessels could heal. And I actually lost a, a piece of skin over here, probably about the size of a nickel. I started to notice an area turn black. He had to go in when he went back in to put the expanders in and remove that. But I only ended up losing maybe between a nickel and a quarter's worth of skin. If he had put those expanders in, my breast surgeon said that she has seen plastic surgeons just shove expanders in there or shove implants in there, stitch them up, and then women have lost so much skin because they don't check for blood flow. And having a good plastic surgeon, I cannot stress that enough. I loved my plastic surgeon. After I got my expanders and that all healed up, then we go to radiation. <laughs> So our plane is broken. So I went up to the lounge to use the bathroom. Made it through half my coffee. <laughs> and now I'm gonna head to our new gate. So, yuck. We ended up leaving Denver about an hour and a half late. We had a, our original plane we got on had a bad circuit breaker. Circuit board, had a circuit board that was bad. So then we had to wait for a new 800 because we were so full. Uh, yeah. So now we're in Dallas. We're gonna board back up and go back to Denver. But I was supposed to take the girls to the Taylor Swift movie. And we were gonna leave our house at nine. The movie starts at 9.30. We'll see. My husband might be doing it now. We'll see. So not as full going back. I think 160 something, 162 people she said. So we'll head back to Denver. Okay, so I'm walking to my car. It's 9.20, like 9.25. <laughs> my husband is taking the girls. So it's my 12 year old stepdaughter and her friend and then my seven year old and her friend to the Taylor Swift movie. <laughs> because I was an hour 30 plus late. I was supposed to take them. He's taking them. He's like, I brought earplugs. So we were late because the first plane, I guess the electrical issue was a circuit board. And I told him, I was like, no, I broke the plane just so I wouldn't have to take the kids. And I go, actually, I'm hanging out at a bar pretending <laughs> to be late. And he's like, what? And I was like, I'm kidding. But I, I go, but I am sitting in the back of a plane with lots of alcohol. So I sent him a picture of me in the back of the plane with a liquor kit. My stomach hurts. Do you guys, like if I don't eat, I get like a air bubble, like it's a gas bubble. Oh, my stomach hurts. I brought food, I didn't bring enough food and I need to go home and eat. All right, good morning. It is, I don't know what it is. It's Tuesday. I have reoccurrent training today. And reoccurrent is something that flight attendants have to take once a year to stay flight attendants. My cats are got the zoomies. It is 6.30 a.m. I have to be in my classroom at eight. And normally, like when I go to the airport, I report, I leave my house an hour before my report. But my report is not when I have to be at the gate. And this has gotten me in trouble in the past. Report is just when I'm on airport property. I need to give myself some extra time because I have to be in the classroom at eight and they close and lock the doors at eight. One of the things that's annoying is it's always put on our board in central time. So you have to always convert that and it's always in central time. And what's annoying is there are other things on our schedule and you can convert it to local time. But for some reason you can't convert the reoccurrent training on there to local time. I've missed it before and it counts as a no-show because I thought I had to be there at the wrong time. I don't know if that was last year or the year before. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like my first year. This is, I think, my 10th reoccurrent because you do reoccurrent almost within the first six months of getting out of training. So I think this is like my 10th. So I'm making Hannah uh, a sandwich. I have the rest of her lunch packed up. She is going to all day care because it is fall break here, but she loves the all day care. So I'm really blessed that that's something she really likes. Clint is super busy. Her sisters are visiting their mom. I got her lunch already. Made myself a bagel. Make my coffee. 
radiation. <laughs> Let's finish this up, radiation. So after I finished chemo, after I had my mastectomy and healed from that, I started radiation. Chemo was every other week and radiation was every day. So I would drive and the drive there took longer than the actual treatment. If anyone has been to had radiation, it's really fast. So I had to get three little tattoos. I have one here, I think I have one further down and one in the armpit so that they could line up the lasers. It just looks like someone touched me with the, the tip of a blue pen. So I have those little tattoos, I had to get that done. And then every day I would go in and wear a gown from the waist up, lay down, and they would do the radiation treatment. Again, I find all the science stuff very interesting. I thought I took pictures. I don't know, I wish I was bolder. I wish I had made more video to be able to share this journey because I know I'm not unique. But, so then I did radiation and I was doing radiation and I was also taking what's called Zolota, which is an oral chemo pill. They had found traces of cancer still in the tissue. After chemo, in the, in the tissue that they got out during my surgery, they biopsy, there was still trace amounts of cancer. So that's why I was taking Zolota. Now, Zolota is super hard on your digestive system and it's super hard on your fingertips and your feet, so my feet would turn beet red and they would just itch. I just wanted to grind them into the carpet and the tips of my fingers would be super like dried out and they would crack. Never trust a fart. <laughs> That's what Zalota was. I'm gonna be transparent. I had a couple times where I was just down the street at the grocery store and I was like, oh, I can make it home to go to the bathroom and I did not make it home. And so that's what I tell people if they ever do that form of oral chemotherapy is never think you can make it home to use the bathroom. That is TMI. That is just true transparency. So I was doing Zolota and radiation and so I burned very badly. And then I had what's called a bolus. So it's like this plastic sheet, thick thing they put on top of my skin. Again, I'm not a doctor. From my understanding, the chemotherapy obviously gets the cellular part and the radiation is trying to get that cancer cells that the chemo didn't get. So they wanted to try and draw that therapy as far up into the skin as they could. And so with the bolus and with the Zolota, I burned really, really bad. So I will insert some pictures of the burn. If you are squeamish, close your eyes for a couple seconds and don't look, so don't look. I burned really bad. I, I don't know if those are second degree burns, but I, I had to wear sterile pads on it and then I had to have this mesh thing to hold everything together. Okay, you can come back now. It was pretty painful. Radiation was fast, but it was harder on my body, I feel like probably because I was doing the Zolota at the same time than the chemo. So radiation for me was particularly hard. I do burn, I'm very fair. I still can see, I can still see the line where I'm still kind of tan from here to here. And so then after radiation, I had to heal from that for six months, I believe it was. And then I was able to get my reconstructive surgery. So for my reconstructive surgery, I chose to not get implants. I chose to get what's called a deep flap. I had a skin sparing mastectomy, which means they basically just kind of hollow your boobs out. <laughs> and then when I had my reconstruction, they took a panel of my stomach. They took a panel of my stomach right here. And with the blood veins still intact, they kind of brought it up underneath and then somehow bisected that tissue to recreate my breasts. And it's a harder surgery up front. I think it was about a 10 hour surgery. Because I didn't do my mastectomy and reconstruction in one, it was shorter because it was two separate surgeries. Some people do their reconstruction right away. Again, that is your doctor and your diagnosis is how they come up with the plan and how all this gets done. That's how they recreated my breast was out of my own tissue. It's a longer surgery. It can be a harder surgery, but I didn't have any other foreign objects. Again, if you go down implant road, 
Everybody needs to make that decision for themselves. But at the time, when I got my implants, they were still recommending replacing implants every 10 to 15 years. I think that might have changed. So I was looking at the possibility of then having to get my implants replaced several times in my lifetime. And I just didn't wanna to have to deal with that. So I went with doing the harder surgery up front. So that surgery is very involved and it took 12 weeks to recover from that because I have to be able to, as a flight attendant, lift 50 pounds. And so I had to be able to be completely healed to go back to work. Yeah, so in that time I did cut my hair. I have some photos of how thin my hair got so thin from the Red Devil. I didn't lose all my hair. I would say I lost like 85 to 90% of my hair. We went on a cruise right after I finished my chemo, before I started the surgery path and the radiation, and my hair was just coming out and I didn't have any eyelashes and I didn't have any eyebrows. <laughs> that's the thing that's weird is like the baldness is one thing, but what they people don't explain is I lost my eyebrows, I lost my nose hair, and I lost my eyelashes. So my nose would be constantly running because I, that's what your nose hair kind of helps keep all that up there. I just looked even more like an albino because I didn't have eyelashes and that was crazy. So we we walked this entire path. I, I was out of work, I think for a year, year and a half. Again, I have a bad memory, you guys. I'll have to look those dates up. And then I finally was able to heal up and go back to work right before the big C, a year before that started. My journey was a long one. It was an intense one, but I have made it through. I am six years out from my initial diagnosis. Five years is the big, big hurdle that you want to get past because most reoccurrences happen within the first five years. And so I am NED, no evidence of disease. They don't really call it remission anymore. They call it NED, no evidence of disease. And so that's where I am, praise God. I have been in this place for six years. And so now my oncology appointments, which were quarterly, went to every six months, have now gone to every year. And that's just an amazing place to be. I'm so excited to be here. And I hope this journey, I hope it wasn't too boring. <laughs> For those of you who stuck with me to the end, I am willing to answer any questions you have about my journey. Again, I'm not a medical professional. I was just really blessed with great doctors. And yeah, so that is my journey, my cancer journey. We'll get back to kind of regularly scheduled flight attendant vlogs. I have to go back to work. <laughs> so I am going to back to work the week of Thanksgiving, Tampa and Philly. So we're gonna do some eating. Then the week after that, I am going to LaGuardia. So I am attempting to bring my husband to New York City. We got engaged in New York City. So that'll be kind of fun. And I am also doing a video about questions for like the spouse or a partner of a flight attendant. So that's the next video coming up. But I hope to see you guys next time in the sky.